Uh, welcome to the All Party Group on Longevity's uh, launch of our uh, latest report, uh, Leveling Up Health. Uh, we have uh, a star cast to put before you this morning, not just my, my fellow authors, uh, Lord Filkin, Jeff Filkin, Tina Woods uh, and Richard Sloggett, but even more importantly than them, uh, the Secretary of State for Health, uh, the Chief Medical Officer and Henry Dimbleby, who leads on the National Food Strategy. Um, so I will just very briefly do some housekeeping. Um, please feel free to use the chat function um, to talk to each other um, and share your thoughts on today's discussion. But if you want to put questions, we will have a, a short period for a QA. and a If you want to put questions to uh, Matt Hancock particularly, uh, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function uh, to do that. Um, but there are very, very, there are 500 people uh, on this uh, webinar, so we're not going to get to all your questions, I'm sorry, but we will get do as many uh, as we can. Um, and I should remind everyone that this today's session is being recorded and it will be made available afterwards. Um, the report itself, uh, I will attempt to summarize in about a minute. Um, essentially, uh, it, it gives rise, the analysis is based on the pretty stark fact that if the, the, the level of health inequality in this country is such that if the least prosperous, most deprived areas had the same health record as the most prosperous uh, areas, then in this current pandemic, 40,000 fewer people uh, would have died. It's, it's as stark as that. And, and to, to look at a bit of the detail, um, in Blackburn and Darwin, 345 people have died per 100,000. In South Cambridgeshire, it's five times less. It's 68 per 100,000. So huge gaps. Um, and you know, we argue that we need a new approach to improving uh, the health uh, of our country. We need to throw away some old ideologies, either that the private sector uh, has no role to play uh, in health, uh, and if you like, on the other side of the political spectrum, that essentially it's, it's for government to, to stand back and let people uh, take their own decisions. We, we think both those old ideologies uh, need to go. Um, we want the government to achieve its uh, stated ambition in the 2019 manifesto that uh, we should have five years extra healthy life uh, by 2035. Uh, we think that's an important uh, ambition. And we think uh, it therefore should focus both on the places where uh, we have the worst health and on five major health issues where government action can make a difference, along with uh, action by individuals and by companies. Those five are smoking, obesity, clean food, clean air and healthy children. Uh, the leadership will have to come uh, from the top. And specifically, uh, we ask for a health improvement fund to improve the health of those communities with the worst health and who've suffered most from the pandemic. 60 local authorities we think should be identified, offered a five-year partnership to improve their health worth 10 million a year on average. So uh, 600 million a year. And, and all of this needs to come together, obviously with the, the, the rest uh, of health policy um, essentially attempting to, to get us into a mindset where we do, if you like, more prevention, so we need to do less cure. Uh, and you know, to take up that old saying that prevention is better than cure. Um, so it, we hope that this fits in with the wider vision for uh, the future of health in this country that uh, Matt has set out. And so that's absolutely enough for me uh, because uh, I'm very grateful uh, to say that um, despite being uh, the busiest uh, man in the country. Uh, Matt Hancock has uh, given up some time to be with us this morning. So um, welcome and over to you, Matt. Well, thank you very much indeed. Dan. Thank you to all of the panelists for your work on this excellent and timely report. I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I wanted to share my reflections and thoughts uh, in response to it. Um, the, the first thing I'd say is that the, the timing of this couldn't be better. We are thankfully coming out of this pandemic. It isn't over yet, uh, but there are now only, I say only, there are now uh, around 2,000 people in hospital across the UK with COVID. Uh, the number of uh, deaths has fallen by 98% since the peak. 
Um, you will have seen the the um, the uh, a publication yesterday by the Office for National Statistics uh, uh, and the Imperial College at London showing that we're breaking the link from cases to death. So I, I say that as a precursor because, of course, um, COVID has had the biggest impact on longevity over the last year uh, of anything um, and any other factor. And it, it should be a motivator to all of us who care about making sure that people's uh, living standards rise and you can't have good living standards without good health. Um, I, I also think that putting this in the frame of leveling up health is important. We want to level up life and you can only level up life by leveling up life expectancy. Um, and for me, uh, improving the disparities in healthy life expectancy is absolutely at the core of our uh, leveling up agenda. Uh, and this fact that the average healthy life expectancy, if you are a man living in Richmond upon Thames, is 18 years longer than if you are a man living in Blackpool, is stark and deeply troubling. Um, and, and that brings me to the, the goal that we've set, that we set in the 2019, well, we set uh, before then, but we uh, committed to, recommitted to in the 2019 manifesto of working to five years of extra healthy life. But the thing is that healthy life is unevenly distributed across the country. And the, the best way to hit that target, to meet that commitment, um, is to level up. Because we know there are not biological barriers to lifting the average healthy life expectancy of a man living in Blackpool by 18 years, because we've done it in this country, in Richmond. Now, of course, at the same time, this is a leveling up agenda, uh, not purely reducing disparities, because I don't want to reduce the healthy life expectancy of somebody living in Richmond in tens. Indeed, I want to raise it. But nevertheless, the, the, both the moral and the social imperative is to increase uh, the uh, healthy life expectancy of those living in the areas where it is lowest. So I welcome the framing and the approach taken in the report. I think it's exactly the right one. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the extra motivation that comes from the experience we've all had over the last year uh, of the COVID uh, crisis uh, is imperative. I also agree with the five areas that you've chosen, uh, smoking, obesity, food, air, and children. Uh, we know that smoking is the single biggest preventable uh, killer uh, in this country. Um, and that is, um, uh, 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 and there the disparities in smoking rates are, uh, are, are still far too wide. And the estimate is that around half the gap in healthy life expectancy can be, um, can be uh, uh, explained and therefore resolved by differences in smoking rates. Um, obesity is clearly um, critical uh, and has had, as uh, Damien said, out, uh, a, a, um, a significant impact on people's morbidity and mortality when hit by uh, COVID. Um, and is a particular obsession of the Prime Minister's uh, after his experience with, uh, with COVID. Um, the, um, and, and I have to say, he's looking absolutely fantastic and has clearly lost quite a lot of weight over the last uh, few months. Um, and um, I, I hope that we can, uh, we can in encourage uh, the nation to too. Uh, food is clearly uh, vital and it's wonderful to see Henry Dumbleby uh, at this session. Uh, with the amazing work that he's been doing leading the debate. Uh, air pollution is also vital. We set out a 25-year uh, air pollution uh, strategy uh, a, um, uh, 18 months or so ago. Uh, and then, of course, all of this starts with children. But I want to focus on how we think that we can do this in the health department, because um, around, around we, we think that around... 80% uh, of the factors that determine your healthy life expectancy are what happens to you outside of hospital. And yet, 
more than eight in uh, in ten, more than eighty percent of the funding of the health service goes to uh, acute care, patching people up after they have uh, become ill. And of course, that's an incredibly important uh, service. But nevertheless, the the uh, disparity in that funding is very clear. And so um, we have decided to tackle this in two ways coming out of the crisis. The first is to bring together all of the policies that affect the health of the nation out with uh, NHS policy and put them under the clear clinical professional leadership of the chief medical officer, who himself is a great advocate uh, in this uh, in this space. And, uh, and I know that he's speaking later. And created, we've created the uh, Office for Health Promotion because I found that having these policy areas driven by people uh, who were working incredibly hard, very dedicated in an arm's length body meant that it just didn't have the same purchase on the system, the same purchase on Whitehall. You couldn't affect housing policy or, uh, or air pollution policy in the same way from an arm's length body. It's far easier from in the core of a department with a chief medical officer as the lead, who is after all the chief medical officer of the government, not just of the department. Uh, he, of course, were, I work very, very closely uh, uh, with uh, Chris Whitty, and he's a brilliant, brilliant man. He reports not only to me, but to the prime minister and is the chief medical officer for the whole government. And I think that this will help because it's incredibly important that we reach across policies in every department and indeed across local government who have such an influence on the outcomes in this space. So I think that is a I think it's a change in structure. You might see it as just moving things around within Whitehall. I think it will have a material positive impact on the policies that we can drive through to improve people's uh, long term health and healthy life expectancy. The second thing is the changes in the NHS. So the way that we've structured the NHS, the way that this country has structured the NHS for many years um, has has led to in my view, too many silos between different parts of the health service uh, and each part uh, being asked to focus on what is directly in front of it. Um, and the cons one of the consequences of that is that it is harder to ensure that the focus is on and ultimately budgets committed to the health of the population as a whole. And so I'm, I'm not against the sort of fund that is proposed in the uh, report. But I want to go further than that. I want to bring the whole budget of the NHS in, an, in a local area to bear on the goal of improving healthy life expectancy. Now, of course, that means ensuring that hospitals can uh, are, are well funded and continue to, uh, to run. Of course it does. But I want to ensure that the incentives are not for hospitals to try to get as many people through their doors as possible but are the incentives of the whole system are to prevent people ending up in expensive secondary care uh, in the first place. And you can do that by putting more support, more funding into the community, a heavily preventative based approach uh, based on this concept of population health, which is at the heart of the NHS reforms proposed by the NHS, uh, embraced by local authorities, uh, the white paper that we set out in February has had probably one of the best receptions of a of a health reform white paper in history because that is a that is a, a checkered history, um, and we'll be taking it through Parliament. But it isn't just about changing the law to allow this to happen and to remove the barriers that currently exist in legislation. It's about then putting in place the population health approach at, at the core of how local systems respond to local health needs and making sure that prevention being better than cure is a principle that runs through every decision, every allocation of resources uh, across the NHS led by the new integrated care systems which bring together health and uh, local authorities. So. I am, I'm excited about this. I think that it's incredibly important. I think we have a better chance to do this than at almost any time uh, in the past. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the alignment of 
uh, of leadership in favor of this approach is very, very strong. Local authorities, the NHS, so Simon Stevens wrote an excellent article in the Times newspaper last weekend describing this approach. Um, we've The new technology and the use of data make this much more effective. The approach will be that it, the response and the, and the action is driven by the data, but informed by the local community. And this is the uh, the uh, the approach that we uh, must take. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is that all of this can be built on the learnings that we've had from uh, COVID, where the need to work as a system has uh, been uh, seen and practiced more than ever before. Many silos have been broken down. Um, and then it, perhaps the single best example of how this can work in the future is the vaccination program where we must take inspiration from the uh, coming together of different organizations to deliver a clear mission and to deliver it with great uh, skill and uh, speed and the vaccination program is a model of how government action can happen in future uh, people united in a common mission across different organizations, bringing their different uh, skills and perspectives to bear uh, to make stuff happen. And it is a uh, it, we've seen it across uh, the health system. Uh, it is a uh, it is a, a clear example of, of how we can take things forward in the future in this area uh, and many others uh, and um, leveling up health. Your uh, your report helps us to point the way. Thank you very much, Matt. That was uh, really interesting and and encouraging as well. So thank you for uh, responding so positively to the report. I don't think I've ever heard a Secretary of State say I want to go further than a demand for money uh, in a in a report. But um, uh, I filed that one away. Um, we've now got I think about ten minutes or so for questions. And looking at the number of questions, we are clearly not going to get through uh, the vast bulk of them. So apologies for that. But I will hand over to uh, Richard Sloggett to uh, feed the questions in. Richard. Damien, thank you. And thank you, so lovely to see you. Um, we've had such a fantastic response to this agenda and this uh, such, it's such, such an important time. One of the tensions that's come out as we've gone through is this tension between the backlogs of care that are building up within the NHS and the ability to invest in the more preventative care that this report in particular focuses on. One of the questions that's come through on the chat, one of the first questions was from David Buck from the King's Fund, exploring how you would potentially try and solve that, that equation of limit, um, only a certain amount of investment and these two different priorities. I wonder whether you could set out some of your early thinking on how you see that playing out. Yes, I, look, I think this is uh, uh, the, the core tension. Um, and if we go back to the history of it, I think David Buck's questions in the Q&A are there's about four of them. They're all excellent, uh, as you would expect. Um, if you think about the history of it, one of the reasons that we have a siloized uh, system and one of the reasons that uh, we have the incentive to drive more activity through secondary care, which is, in my view, the wrong uh, in structural incentive for improving long-term health, is because of an understandable desire in the uh, mid 2000s to really drive down waiting lists. And so if you structure the NHS, I know this is, you know, it gets quite technical, but if you structure the NHS finances to target as many, to do as many operations as possible, um, and um, the incentives then have the unintended consequence of essentially encouraging more and more focus on a discrete secondary care um, activities when increasingly people have multi-morbidities that require more uh, more preventative action. Um, and so there is that tension. We should acknowledge the reality of the tension. And the fact is that with um, the number of people waiting more than a year because of the pandemic um, and the waiting list having grown, we are going to have to tackle that. But you've got to do that with your eyes open. And I think essentially, uh, the pendulum swung far too far in that direction and needs to be brought back. However, there is one area where I would say it isn't a balance, um, and that is in diagnostics. So the waiting list, of course, includes both people waiting for a treatment and waiting for a diagnostic. 
And so the, the majority of people on the waiting list are actually waiting for a diagnostic, not for a treatment. But the way that diagnostics have been done just through history and tradition in this country is that they're done by hospitals one at a time. You, unless you go, sometimes diagnostics are needed, obviously, uh, for uh, very urgently for urgent care. Um, and, you know, somebody calls up from uh, uh, from uh, emergency department and says we, we need an urgent MRI. Fine. But um, standard outpatient diagnostics are done one at a time. You go and have your CT scan. You get the results back. You then have a consultation based on that. And then you're, you need an MRI scan. So you go and have the MRI scan. Each one of these is one item on the waiting list. You could end up wait, having each, you might have four tests in a row. Each one you might get within three months. It counts as meeting a three month deadline on a waiting list three, uh, four times, but you're waiting a year to find out what's wrong with you. That is no good for anybody. So we're switching the approach to diagnostics to have, to have diagnostics hubs. In fact, I was, um, I was in Birmingham um, seeing one being built, literally coming out of the ground, um, and in um, uh, at part of Heartlands Hospital, um, and there you will go, and you will have the the suite of diagnostics that you may need, um, and in fact, there they will then use the uh, immediate, and they use technology on the results immediately to find out if there are more that you might need whilst you're there, um, and then you can proceed with. Um, uh, with diagnosis and, and, and treatment. Um, and that would count as one on the waiting list. You know, so the way that you count these things have an impact. But crucially, diagnostics are central to prevention. Because if you wait for a year, you'll be more ill, you'll have a more expensive treatment, most likely, uh, because you can't catch it early. So prevention um, interacts with the, with the pure elective surgery waiting list through the fact that Prevention is better than cure applies to getting early diagnosis as well. And that is how we, I think, will be able to, um, uh, to square that circle. But I acknowledge that that is only part of the circle and in, in part there's a, there's, there's a balance too. Another, another question we've had from Chris Wigley from Genomics England is about the potential of data and the UK's health technology and life science ecosystem to actually come to bear on tackling these health inequalities through better data and information. Through the pandemic, we've seen how some of this has been really effective. I wondered if you could set out a bit more, you've got a data strategy planned, how important you think that agenda is moving forward? We're doing a lot of work through the APPG on it. Yes, look, the data strategy is absolutely critical. Uh, we're working uh, on it now. Uh, we're, there's, there's two things that I'd say. Firstly, um, the youth of data again in diagnostics is absolutely critical and if you think about it understanding your genome simply helps your diagnostics um in a way um you know the most direct application of uh, uh full genome sequencing is in shortening the diagnostic odyssey for rare diseases some people with a rare disease will wait you know six eight ten years uh, through multiple, multiple expensive tests to find out what's wrong that a genomic sequence can, uh, can identify immediately. Um, but so there's that, there's that way of looking at it, <clears throat> and it's incredibly important. And obviously, Genomics England it, you know, is, one of the, is one of the most important institutions in the country. Um, but the other way of looking at it is the, the better use of, um, of existing data, of mainstream data. Um, not that, I mean, uh, genomic sequencing is increasingly mainstream, but of, of the data that we're collecting anyway, uh, to spot and identify uh, 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 problems, risks, uh, and to manage the system better. So, use of data for the in for the individual diagnosis of a uh, of a patient vital. Use of data in order to drive the system is vital, and uh, because to have a preventative approach. Uh, you, you have to understand what are the actions are needed in a particular area. And again, I come back to the vaccination program. So in Leicester, in the vaccination program, they have the most incredible rich uh, uh, data uh, set where given that there are 50 languages spoken in Leicester, 50 broadly different communities, um, there are, um, there is a, they understand which community has what take up in what age group of vaccination. 
you can spot to a pretty detailed level where the gaps are. And as a result, they've been able to drive up vaccination. For instance, they spotted that in the, uh, the Somali community, the vaccination take up were particularly low. And so despite the fact that Somali community live right next door to the vaccination center, they put in another vaccination center in the Somali community, staffed only by people from that community. Um, and that essentially addressed the problem. And they could do that because they had excellent data to, to look at the cross section between uptake and, uh, and ethnicity in that case. Now there's one example, and it is a, it, it, you know, the use of data, data to identify the problem and then working with the community on how to solve it. This is a, this is a model for how good uh, preventative healthcare can be done. We've only got a couple of minutes left and I've got two more important topics to cover. One is, you mentioned about the Office of Health Promotion, this new central function, but I wanted just for you to unpack if you could, how you see that central function working with places, particularly local government moving yeah. moving forwards? Yeah, so uh, Chris will be able to say more on this, but the aim is that um, the, the, um, the directors of public health in a local area are going to be more and more important. I mean, they, they've been... The, the directors of public health were one of the uh, really good things to come out of the 2012 Act. Uh, during the crisis, they have played an absolutely invaluable role. Uh, essentially, a, a, a you know a mini uh, Chris Whitty in every uh, in every uh, upper tier council. Um, and the but uh, but because they're a relatively new invention, they've been around for a decade. Um, there isn't a um, there isn't a the professional structure for directors of public health. And there will be, the directors of public health will look to the, the, uh, the CMO in the new approach, as well as, of course, looking to the UK Health Security Agency for communicable diseases. And we're splitting the responsibilities of communicable and non-communicable diseases uh, for, uh, to ensure that somebody's always looking out for the next pandemic for a different reason. Um, the, um, and so that will be the link, essentially, through a strengthened structure of, uh, of directors of public health who have done this, uh, this amazing job. And final question is on your plans for engagement with two key groups, the public directly on this health promotion agenda and with business and the role of business in this. OK, so I, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to strengthen your question because uh, I'm also going to uh, uh, add in charities in the third sector. Um, because, um, so firstly, the aim of population health is to improve the health of the local population. I mean, it does what it says on the tin. Um, for that, you need budgets locally to be much more flexible. And so Mohammed Sadat has got a, a question about, uh, from, about in Blackburn, engaging small grassroots charities. You know, at the moment, CCGs spending the NHS budget in a local area have, have remarkably little leeway they have to spend according to a essentially according to a um, uh, a tariff that's set at the national level. I want much more flexibility for the ICS locally to be able to support grassroots charities that pro usually do work that is so much better value for money than uh, than spending it a tick and a turn style uh, at the uh, at the acute hospital. Um, and um, so the, so making sure that the third sector um, is properly supported. In its, um, in its preventative work is incredibly uh, important. Uh, but we've also learned during the pandemic, and again, I come back to it, the vaccination program, uh, governments can't do these things on our own. We need that, we need the, 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 we need private businesses who do amazing work in saving lives. Just look at uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, uh, and the rest of them. Um, the, um, uh, and, uh, institutions across the board, essentially, no matter what the what their uh, what their uh, structure was. That the question that you were asking? I think it, I think it was a better question. Um, <laughs> thank you, State. Thank you so much. That concludes the virtual Q and A. Thank you so much for making the time for the APPG for longevity this morning. Damien, back to you. Thanks, Richard, and and thanks for me as well, Matt. Uh, that was uh, really really interesting. Thank you. Um, and it's, it's now my privilege, having introduced somebody as you know, the busiest man in the country, uh, giving up some time to us. I can now plausibly again, half an hour later, say we've now got the busiest man in the country uh, because 
Uh, Professor Chris Whitty uh, is our next speaker. Uh, the phrase needs no introduction uh, is overused, but um, is true in this case, so I won't bother. Just straight over to you, Chris. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And please say if you can't hear me. Um, I, I mean, I think that this, I mean, I'm going to build on some of the points the Secretary of State's been making. First thing is, this, I think this is an excellent report. Um, there's some bits of it which I consider a political, I don't mean that in a party political sense, but a kind of things for ministers. And there are some bits in it which are technical, and I'm going to concentrate on the technical bits because that's really my, my role. Um, and, you know, time being short, I'm just going to concentrate on a few points within it. We could go in almost any direction from it. There are a huge number of things within a very short report. It's got a lot of very interesting points. I'd like to uh, build on a few of them. I mean, the, the first one is uh, a, a very strong emphasis on place. So you, you highlight um, uh, five areas which we should be pushing on, I'll come back to that. Uh, and then you say we must really be looking in the places where the problems are greatest. And I think one of the things we are going to have to do if we want to take this seriously uh, is um, realize that there are parts of the country which are geographically dispersed, but are very similar to one another. I'm gonna take an example of coastal, uh, coastal towns. I could take many other examples. There is usually more in common between coastal towns and uh, one another than there is between a coastal town and its nearest inland neighbor. And they have some of the worst health outcomes in the country, despite being wonderful places to live. Uh, and all the things you've talked about, smoking, obesity, uh, dip, uh, less good food, uh, maybe clean air is the exception to this and healthy children are concentrated in those areas. And we don't yet have national policies for coastal towns or for inner city areas where there are significant uh, minority ethnic populations from di with different heritages and so on. Uh, and so I think we should nationally be looking at these places, not as just individual, you know, this is Blackpool, it's got a problem, please sort it out local authority, but as a problem set that is shared across the whole of the country. And I think building on very much on the pillars that you've uh, put forward in your, your report. So I'm just saying I completely agree on place. I'm just saying I think we should not just think about it as just a single point in the map. Second, second point uh, really is that um, the, uh, the creation of the Office for Health Promotion um, uh, is going to have its teething problems because every reorganisation does, but it also provides a consider considerable opportunity. Uh, and I think that the um, one of the opportunities, and this is again is building on something the Secretary of State said and your report said, uh, is to work more effectively with the NHS. I think, I think we should be honest and say, and I say this as an NHS worker myself, the link up between public health and the NHS is sporadic at the present time. And many of the points that you've made in the report really require that link up to be considerably more uh, systematic uh, if we're actually to uh, achieve the, uh, the aims that you're, 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 you're hoping for. Uh, some things are actually gonna go straight over to the NHS as part of PHE's reorganization. But I think that there are quite a number of areas where if the, if the NHS doesn't uh, choose to engage um, in a systematic way, as opposed to just individual practitioners doing so, uh, I think we will have some difficulty with several of these issues. Third point is you make, an is you make a very important series of points about the relationship with industry. And um, I think it is really important we don't view all industries the same. So it is quite difficult, for example, to work out a way in which we can have a positive engagement with the cigarette industry, because essentially we do not want the cigarette industry to exist from a public health point of view. There may be some, you know, there are obviously reasons of, uh, people of choice and uh, various other public policy things, but from a public health point of view, that's clearly the case. Whereas if you're talking at the other, uh, other extreme, in a sense of, let's say, the food industry, we can have an incredibly positive relationship and should have an incredibly positive relationship building on your point about obesity and clean food, two of the things that you've highlighted, you know, we should be aiming to uh, work in a way that has attractive food that really suits people, uh, but at the same time um, uh, makes a profit uh, in the current way, but is healthier than it is at the moment. And we should be trying to work out a way of uh, a positive and long-term engagement. And as you say in the report, not assuming that just exhort exhortation is going to do the trick. It is going to require uh, harder levers than that. Uh, and um, the, the final uh, two points I wanted to make, the first of which is on clean air. Uh, clean air is a problem much more of inner city areas, uh, but it is a really serious problem and a, a overlapping but different problem to all these issues around climate change, which 
are often conflated, but I think I think wrongly. This is a really good time in history to try and tackle this. This is the first time really there is a realistic possibility of taking the great majority of uh, energy uh, needs away from um, things that are polluting uh, towards things that are not. This is whether it's transport, whether it's heating, whether it's a variety of other areas. So technologically, we're at a point this is a realistic thing to do. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think this is an area we really should be pushing on now because 20 years ago, this was really difficult to do, even 10 years ago. Now, this is actually simply a matter of choice. We have the technology, it's a matter of whether we use it. And my final point is about evidence, uh, particularly when we're asking people to do difficult things, unpopular things or expensive things. We've got to have a very strong evidence base. If we don't re reasonably, people will say, why should we do this? Uh, and uh, we have been, I think, quite weak at looking at evidence in, for example, local authorities and in some of the more peripheral areas where many of the biggest health problems are. We've really got to make sure that uh, public health evidence base, academia and uh, charity sector, uh, along with local authorities, is building an evidence base, which means we can actually take some of these harder decisions with some confidence they're going to actually do something useful rather than just because they might. There's plenty more I could say, but I think it's a really excellent report. Chris, thank you very much, both both for that and and for uh, your, your your words about the report. Um, the evidence base, I think, is it, that's a really interesting thing. Which, um, as an APPG, uh, we are looking you know, at at technological solutions, at, at databases, and so on. Uh, and it may be that uh, towards the end, Tina might have a few more words to say about that. But but absolutely, thank you uh, very much for that. And of course, one of the other areas that uh, the report concentrates on is food and and, and that effect on health. So uh, it is uh, with great pleasure that I hand over to Henry Dimbleby, the lead on the National Food Strategy, to address that particular vitally important part uh, of the health equation. Henry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Damien. Uh, it, it was a fantastic report. It was a real breath of fresh air, I felt, not just uh, in its brevity and clarity of, uh, of writing and of thinking. Uh, I, I love the way that it focused both on obesity and on food. As everyone on this call will know, uh, it is possible to suffer from food-related disease and be uh, thin, and it is possible to massively improve your health outcomes by improving your diet while not losing weight. So recognizing that uh, the, the problems of food go beyond obesity was a, a breath of fresh air. But most importantly, it begins to change, to challenge fundamental misconceptions among the decision makers and the general public about why our food system, which is my concern, is making us sick. In the late 50s, Donella Meadows was a founding member of the System Dynamics Department at MIT, and they were set up because they were intrigued by the failure of human intervention in so many complex systems. Complex systems formed by uh, interacting feedback loops are famously hard to predict, even across small timescales. Minuscule changes in starting conditions can over time lead to huge differences in outcomes. Uh, and attempting to control them even loosely is hard and many well-intentioned endeavors fail. And the MIT team, through their mathematical mod modeling offer a route to how you can make successful interventions in complex systems. And this is sum up, summed up by uh, Meadows in her work, Thinking in Systems. And in that she lists 12 ways in which we can try to intervene to change systems for the better. And at the top of this list is changing the paradigm. And I quote her, the shared idea in the minds of society the great big unstated assumptions constitute that society's paradigm or deepest set of beliefs about how the world works. So no number of interventions, taxes, incentives, bans or nudges will work unless you get that paradigm right and you create a shared paradigm. And the current paradigm is neatly summed up in a recent the sun says, attacking the actually very successful sugary drinks level. And I quote again, we need to concentrate on the real solutions, better education on diet and exercise. Now, opinion polls show that this paradigm, 
that education, exercise and willpower is the answer is per pervasive and particularly among those who are suffering most from poor diet. And yet everything about that paradigm is demonstrably, provably, with data, wrong. And I'd, if the Sun are here today, I would love to discuss this with them. And not only is it wrong, it's actually likely to make things worse. So first, if you look at exercise, uh, our weight is actually uh, created by an interaction between appetite and our metabolism. And all of the evidence shows that exercise is an extraordinary good in itself, that we should all be exercising. It's the most powerful thing we can do, probably more powerful even than diet in increasing and improving our health. But it won't help you lose weight. Uh, and this has been reinforced by the work of, work of Herman Potzner recently. Uh, it can help you maintain a healthy weight, but because of the way in which appetite and metabolism works, it is not the solution to losing weight. And by making it the solution to losing weight, you get thousands of people going to gyms, signing up, trying to lose weight, exercising, and then failing to lose weight, and then giving up on the exercise, which is the thing that is most important. Uh, the most important thing about the exercise is the good it delivers in itself. The second uh, misconception is that we don't know about what is healthy. Almost everyone knows that they need to be eating more vegetables, less foods high in fat and sugar. And yet this idea that somehow we need to educate them. There are skills gaps, cooking, how you create healthy, uh, healthy uh, food, dinners, but the knowledge gap is not there. What we actually individually and as a society uh, need to focus on is on why our appetite is going so wrong. Why is this extraordinary uh, feedback mechanism, one of the most beautiful uh, evolutionary uh, things in design. It, it focuses us not only on eating enough food, but on the right kinds of food. If we're short of certain minerals, we will instinctively eat soil to replace them. This is a very, very powerful mechanism. And yet it's going wrong horribly and making us sick. And the reason it's making us sick is not because we're not exercising, not because we don't have the amount of exercise. It's because of a junk food cycle, a uh, a, a collaboration, a combination of uh, our appetite making us prefer highly calorie dense foods, high in sugar and, and, uh, and fat that we desire. Uh, we eat more of them before they make us hungry. And uh, as we eat them, they, 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 they provide more calories than say two extra bites of broccoli. And that is combined with the commercial incentive for food companies to devote much more of their research and development and their marketing delivering those products. And you get a vicious cycle. You've got, we prefer those products, food companies market them, they advertise them, they make us eat more of them and so on. And this is a classic negative reinforcing feedback loop creating a race to the bottom. And unless we accept that we need to break that feedback loop, we will never achieve what we need to when it comes to, di to diet. And this report is a, a really bold step in beginning to change that paradigm. And I hope that everyone on this call uh, will, will take it and its message uh, out there to your communities and to decision makers you know. Paradigms are changed by people spreading the word and not in a cross way, not blaming companies or shaming people, but just pointing out that we've got the paradigm wrong and we need to change it. And until we change that paradigm, we cannot expect anything else to change. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Henry. Um, we, we have kept amazingly to time. So uh, we have got time for uh, a couple of questions before I ask uh, Tina and Lord Filkin to uh, wind up. So uh, Richard, have you got any, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if Professor Whitty is is still with us, but but Henry obviously is. So if there are any suitable questions, Richard, over to you. Henry, lots of supportive I am comments coming through on the chat and the Q&A. One question that has also popped up is on the environment in which people buy their foods. And I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about the sort of the, the idea of the sort of wider food environment and how that impacts on our health and the obesity agenda. 
Yeah, I mean, that is part of the junk food cycle. So I mean, I, I think the other thing I'd say about the junk food cycle is that increasingly the CEOs of the food companies are breaking cover and saying they need government to help because of the competitive incentive. They can't do this on their own. And the environment which is the advertising we see, the way in which, you know, if you go into, there are, there are 28 different kinds of Kit Kat in the UK. Uh, and they're, you know, you know, which is no surprise because you make more money out of Kit Kats than kale. And when you go into a convenience store, you are presented with the most beautiful array of highly colored, uh, attractive, tasty bursts of fat and sugar. And that is because of the junk food cycle. And so I think it is difficult so the interventions, one of the problems is that uh, you don't know which interventions are going to work. And in a very political system, you would ideally trial and test. And one of the things we're thinking about is how do you allow the system to be more adaptive? But the environment is definitely part of the, uh, the overall problem. And I wonder if I could also ask uh, Professor Witte um, about the new Office for Health Promotion and its work across government. The Secretary of State talked about your existing role as the lead medical advisor to government, prime minister, as well as, as himself. Many of the comments coming through on the Q&A are related to the fact that these problems will not be solved by the Department of Health and Social Care on its own. Professor Whitty, I wondered if you could set out a little bit more about how you see that cross-functional relationship with other government departments working. Uh, I mean, I think if we don't get that to work, uh, we'll, we'll miss out on the great majority of the key things, most of which you've highlighted in your report. Um, I think that the, there are kind of uh, three sets of reasons why it doesn't tend to happen. Uh, I mean, the first, and the, the first and the one we do have to just acknowledge is that the interests of some government departments uh, are not aligned with public health naturally. And therefore, there has to be a kind of negotiation where you say to people, actually, this is a really pretty critical part of what we're doing to serve, to serve our citizens. The second, uh, which is much easier, uh, is when people just haven't, it hasn't occurred to people, they could do it equally easily one way or another way. And one of them is going to lead strongly to a public health outcome that's positive and one is not. Uh, it's going to be difficult. And the third, and I think this is actually almost the, almost the most common one that is tractable, is that big, some of the big problems are scattered across multiple departments of state. Let's take clean air, which is one that you've highlighted. Uh, you know, Department of Transport, Bays, Treasury, Health, you know, uh, DEFRA all have a major part of this. No one owns the whole totality of it. And some of the costs sit in one area and some of the uh, benefits sit in another area. And that's something we, that has to be taken as a whole of government issue. And you made the point in your report with which I wholly agree that this will only work if it's led from number 10, because only, only from the center can people say, look, actually, we've just got to do this. So I think that's a really critical part of this. And one other question we've, we've had, Chris, is on the, the medical curriculum and how you can actually get more focus on prevention within the education system for our healthcare professionals. I don't know whether you have any views and reflections on that. It felt like a very interesting thought. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that the curriculum is fine. Um, but the problem is that people then don't get see any public health in practice. So they, they learn about it. Uh, and most of medicine is learnt uh, in practice. And so they will do, they'll do some courses in medical school, perfectly well taught. They'll learn some stuff, but then they'll spend their, most of all, most people spend most of their careers actually seeing patients, which is entirely right and proper. Um, so I think we, we do need to get some experiential learning going. And in particular, we also need to make sure that people are trained in the parts of the country where there is a real need for clinical care. What we know from medicine, as with many other professions, is most people work for their career within a very small number of miles, usually within about 15 miles, almost always within 50 miles of where they trained. And therefore, don't be surprised if we're having shorter people who are interested in public health and so on uh, in, in places like uh, Wigan. Uh, if actually everyone is trained in London and Sheffield. So I think it is really important that we, we think about place and training uh, and experience as well as the actual course, the curriculum. Terrific, thank you. And then final question for you, Henry, is on the next stages with your food review. We've had some practical questions about when you're next going to be coming out with some further work. So all things being equal, we're hoping to publish part two in July, and that will address not only the junk food cycle, but the other kind of big uh, feedback, uh, systems feedback loop that's going wrong, which is the invisibility of nature. So we're gonna try and put together, I could, could not agree with um, 
Chris Mitty more about the need for these huge societal issues, which both of which uh, are, are seen much worse by people who are less affluent to be led across government by number 10. But we'll be publishing ideas in, in July and then campaigning through the year into COP26 and so on to, to try to get those ideas implemented by government. Terrific. Chris, Henry, thank you so much for those responses. Uh, and with that, Damien, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, my thanks as well to, to both of you. That was that was fascinating. Now for um, the last few minutes, uh, I will hand over to uh, the other co-authors of the report and indeed the, the driving forces behind uh, the APPG, uh, Lord Filkin and uh, Tina Woods. So, uh, Jeff, I think you were going to go first. Thank you, Damon. Um, and uh, what um, three great speeches uh, really emphasising that this is indeed a moment for change. Um, it's a moment for change because the needs are there and the opportunities, but we're also seeing an remarkable alignment of the leadership figures, uh, as has been demonstrated on this call. So uh, what, next, uh, what next for us um, as the APPG? What next for you um, as participants in this? In terms of the APPG, we'll be spending the next six to 12 months on promoting and socialising uh, the conclusions in the report. We'll do, as you would expect, we'll talk with government ministers, with senior officials. Uh, we look forward to having uh, deep discussions with uh, Chris Whitty in his new great role. We'll also be discussing outside um, government, or we'll be discussing with local government, the local government association, directors of public health. We'll be discussing across the political spectrum. We would hope that this increasingly is seen as a cross-party issue like the NHS is seen. In other words, an issue and a goal that all society, all parties need to get behind rather than being a party political football, because that does so much damage to the goal. So we look forward to those discussions, which we'll hold in the next few weeks or so. I think also we won't ignore NHS and business, and we'll have different mechanisms for talking with them, but they will certainly be part of how we wish to engage with them about the need and the opportunity, and not least for charities. How can charities do more on this, both at national and local level? How can they cohere their efforts to support and mobilize change? Uh, because um, this is an agenda for all of society, not just for government. It would be a big mistake to think it's all government's fault, it's all government's responsibility, just let's stand back. That won't work, we've all got to get behind it. Which brings me on to uh, what you can do. First of all, um, something unusual, would you please read the report? Um, we often attend these events. Uh, it's not very long. We spent uh, four months making it as short as we possibly could. Uh, and it was quite hard work doing so, but great fun. Secondly, ask yourself the question, what can you do uh, either personally uh, or in terms of the organization that you have? If you've got ideas, uh, do ping Tina and me, Damien or Richard, and we can't, cohere everybody, but we will look, be looking for alliances, because I think we've all got to work on this effectively to support government action, to promote government action, and to urge government to do more uh, wherever it can. Otherwise, government won't lead with its chin on some of the difficult areas. So it needs you also to work with us. So really, just two words of thanks. First of all, thanks to my three great colleagues. It has been remarkable that we can work together for four months with no organization and no money and no budget and produce work like this. Um, and there's been a great, we still actually speak to each other, which is quite a, a miracle in the circumstances. And lastly, thank you all for coming. Uh, I wish we'd had capacity to have a thousand on the, on the call because uh, there's a lot of disappointed people, but we'll send the video around and please do keep in touch with us and engage with it as we go forward. Now uh, over to Tina for the real stuff. Tina. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I hope um, everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you to everyone who has come today. Um, and just to set the record straight, I was a bit perplexed to see many multiples of Tina Woods on the chat and the question, the Q&A, but I can assure you there are no Tina Woods clones around, so just make that straight. <laughs> um, so we've been very, very um, busy, as you know, with the APPG um, since the Health and Nation was published um, last February, actually, just before COVID. 
um, and two of them have actually been, um, are, are firmly underway. So just a quick word on that. Um, and they're all about, as Matt, Matt Hancock, um, our Secretary of State has just said, it's all about leveling up life, which is um, unfortunately unevenly distributed, which is obviously our main task ahead. Um, both of these initiatives are actually referred in the report. So please do, as Jeff said, please do read the report. Um, one is, is Business for Health, um, a coalition of business leaders, um, uh, which was launched in November 2020 to look at how business can do more to contribute to the nation's health. Uh, this is a social enterprise that was set up and supported by a number of organizations, um, including Legal in General, the Phoenix Group, AXA Health, UKRI, and the Center for Aging Better. We've seen the economic damage caused by poor health. Um, and our first project is scoping out a business index to report on business contributions to health. And many of the individuals on our working group are here today on, 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 the, on the call. Um, we want to look at both positive and negative impacts and take lessons from the climate change experience where major investments are driven by ESG mandates. Uh, second is the Open Life Data Framework. Um, so this is uh, all about uh, the, uh, uh, looking at the role of data and technology in this paradigm shift that we've been talking about on this call today. Um, so I think Angela will be sending a, a link uh, to uh, an article, a comment piece that was just literally published in Lancet online um, 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 last night. Uh, it's, it's cited in the report as well. Uh, but a task group was, uh, was actioned last year to explore how we can harness um, life data, we've called it, um, both healthcare data, but also non-health data for health, which is the most important data to look at in terms of keeping us healthy and well. And of course, Henry pointed us to the importance of food and nutrition and our wider environment and all this. So we look at this whole concept of the ex exposome, how we can live healthier and longer lives and more equitable lives um, and takes experience from other sectors like open banking. And I know Gavin's on the call today, which significantly opened up innovation uh, for the benefit of the, um, the SME sort of startup fintech sector, but most importantly, uh, for the benefit of consumers, citizens. Um, our initial work last year fed into the national data strategy and funding from the Health Foundation has enabled us to continue with a view to publish a framework in September this year. Uh, it's chaired the whole the working group, many of whom are on the call today, uh, is chaired by Lord O'Shaughnessy, who's been very involved in the work of the APBG. And we are exploring strategies uh, to achieve pandemic resilience, develop use cases for innovators and entrepreneurs, and inform the value of UK health data sets to feed into the UK global ambition in science and AI. Uh, hot off the press, as you'll see, is the Lancet piece. So do actually read it. And it spells out why our work is important. So Jeff mentioned how much we've been able to do on very, very limited resources. And the reason why we're so productive and agile and speedy is because of the extensive partnerships uh, that we have struck across many organizations in public and private sector. And it's this true collaborative spirit that is that has really driven the system change this sort of paradigm shift that Henry spoke about that we need to see. So we're really, really grateful. We need to do more. And of course, we're always reliant on our supporters and of course, funding. And on the back of the report are, is, um, are the, our current sponsors. And of course, we are looking for more um, for, for all the work that we want to do ahead. So please do come to us if any of you are wish, willing to support our work. So I'm gonna hand over to Damien. So I think we're, we're coming to time, but thank you for, for coming today. Tina. And can I just um, close by saying thank you uh, both, obviously, to everyone uh, who's come along, uh, and in particular to all our uh, cast uh, speakers. It's been a, an absolutely uh, fascinating hour, and we hope that you know, maybe people who've not been uh, working with the APPG, as one of the partnerships teams just talked about, um, will consider doing so uh, in future. We can only uh, do this work in partnership with, with a lot of people. We do that already. We would always uh, wish to do more of that. But uh, thank you all uh, very much again for coming uh, and good morning. Bye.